Do Australians need an online right-to-be-forgotten law? And can we trust Google's new privacy sandbox? Hey there. Welcome back to Vertical Hold Behind the Tech News, the award-winning tech podcast where we catch up with Australia's leading technology journalists and commentators to dive into the big tech news of the week. I'm Adam Turner, and I'm joined, as always, by Alex Kidman. Now, Alex, the Apple rumor mill's gone into hyperdrive, saying we might see a foldable iPhone and the mythical Apple AR VR headset this year. Are you already saving your pennies? Well, look, I think it would be very bold of Apple to release both products this year, like (laughs) seriously bold, because neither of those things are going to be, shall we say, affordable or sane. So I think my pennies can sit in the piggy bank that's been sitting there waiting for the Apple car and Apple flat screen TV all these years. Fair enough. So this week, we're joined by a new guest on the show from the Consumer Policy Research Centre. It's Chandani Gupta. Chandani, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Hello. What are you saving up your pennies for tech-wise this year? Oh, you know what? Back in the day, I loved a good flip phone. Mm -hmm. Um, I was very little at the time, but I really liked it. So yeah, it wouldn't be a bad thing. But what I'm actually really saving up for would be, I love my my notebooks, like my paper and pens, but uh, something that can make can be a digital notebook that would be just lovely and I know there's a couple out there that I'm researching at the moment working out which one to go with We've, you've come to the right place we can help you with it. <laughs> let's talk after the show yes <laughs> we will we will thank you <laughs> so it's a big week in digital privacy with as we said Google's launching a new privacy sandbox for Android users because if there's one group you can trust your data with it's clearly Google but before that it's been a big week for all Australians in terms of privacy with proposed changes to the Privacy Act, which could change a hell of a lot of things since it was introduced way back in 1988. Alex, briefly, what's on the table here? So there's quite a lot of proposal and actually, I mean, to a certain extent, quite a lot of detail. It's a, I think it's like a 320-page document. It's, a, it's fairly serious bedside reading covering everything from the way businesses collect and store data and the way consumers and ordinary people can then interact with that data and and keep it safe and keep it private. Um, Chandni, uh, what big changes are you seeing in this that you think are, are kind of most significant? Well, one thing, I mean, it's so fantastic that it is finally coming out of the 80s and we're leaving behind the floppy disks and the CDs and we're finally going to be in the 21st century, which is so exciting. I'm What I'm really seeing is the way they're proposing reforms that really go beyond notification and consent. That's a really positive move and, and their way of expanding the definition of personal information and really modernizing what it means to be identifiable. That was really pleasing to see that they're considering that. Um, And then putting those stronger obligations on businesses to really assess how they're collecting and using data, which is which is not something that is currently in place at the moment. Uh, And so those are three things are really I'm really positive to see that they're they're openly discussing about it. They've made they've proposed some really big reforms. And if they go through, we'll be we'll be in a space where we can really be protected by the digital economy that is there now and what will come in the future, as opposed to what was sitting there in the 80s. And let's face it, I think internet was only just coming on board in the 80s. So the fact that it our privacy uh, act at the moment is has protections in there from a time when internet wasn't even a thing uh, to now um, getting into a reform, getting into a position where it is really going to help protect consumers when they are online, when they're interacting, they're getting their products and services, when they're connecting with others online, knowing that there is a better way uh, for them to be protected in, in that space. That is That has been really, really positive to see at this stage. 
So are we just talking big picture things here or we're seeing detail? Because I can see a lot of phrases like risks must be considered and protections applied accordingly, which kind of means stuff all until you actually, you know, that could mean anything. Who makes the decisions on what these mean? And are we getting to the point where we'll actually figure all that out or are we still just trying to establish the general aim, overall ambitions? So it's really a mix. So what I've seen, from what I've seen so far, which is from 6 a.m. this morning, so <laughs> forgive me, but what I've seen so far is that in in some cases they're, they're really clear about what is going to be included or what they would like to have included, should I say. So things like the personal information, they've been really clear that it's not going to be just personal information, but information that is inferred about you or it's related to you. So getting really down to the specifics. But in many of the other aspects of it, it's, it is going to be in the detail. And something that I've noticed is in quite a, quite a few stages, they in the paper, they've specifically said um, uh, the information commissioner will provide guidance on this um, or will provide extra guidance and examples on this. And that is going to be really interesting. It does mean that the Privacy Act could be quite flexible um, because it can evolve over time as guidance is updated and expanded. But it does mean we are there is still a level of uncertainty potentially of where some of those um, where some of how far some of those protections will go so it's at some point some aspects of it are a bit wait and watch so uh, i mean australian consumer law for example is deliberately broad and vague and that's generally seen as a good thing because it it expands protections it keeps us safer and it means you don't have to modify australian consumer law quite as much we've already established it's been an awfully long time since the privacy act was redefined. Is keeping it broad and vague perhaps, and I'm very much devil's advocating here, is that perhaps a good thing because it then might allow for that kind of broad scope, right, this actually means a lot more for those technologies coming, you know, not just right now that it's catching up to, but 10, 20 years down the track? So definitely a principles-based approach allows that flexibility. It allows P, um, the act to kind of evolve over time because we know of the harms that are being caused now by collecting and um, sharing data, by the way it's being used, by the way it's being, um, why predictions are made about people, how data is enabling what you see, what you don't see, what you're excluded from. So these are things that we're seeing now, but having that principle-based approach does mean that it is there then for the future to be able to be able to not have to be reiterated over and over and you don't also want to limit the scope so uh, their approach to of having a principle base is great but it's the guidance and the way the leaning towards the guidance and what that will look like and also how much um how much will be looked at in the guidance and whether the guidance, you also don't want the guidance being misused by particular actors. So that's where I think the tension will be. Um, and that's really in the detail of what will come out later. Is there anything missing here? Anything that people were expecting or hoping for that they've just overlooked? So there's two things that really, um, it, it's not quite clear. One is uh, a really we were really hoping for a very clear pathway to redress when things go wrong. So when you have an issue with your telco, with your so your mobile phone provider or with your energy provider, there's an ombudsman you can go to. So you can go there, you can get your help when, you, when things have gone wrong and you can't sort it out with the supplier. Um, it isn't really quite clear how redress is going to be managed in the Privacy Act at this stage. They are talking about a direct right of action um, and that, of course, it opens up the opportunity for class actions. It means people can individually take on action, which is, which is great, but it does mean the onus is still kind of seems like it's sitting on the consumers and on people to actually resolve these issues so it would have been great like we have always we've been championing the idea of a digital ombudsman where you don't have to think about was it a privacy harm i had was it a, a was it an issue with the actual marketplace that i was at the, if it's a harm that's happened um digitally if you've you've gone through that you've been harmed via an it, 
through the online space, you should be able to have a way forward that is a clear way to get redress and remedy. Um, so that at the moment is, is a little unclear. The other thing that really, um, is not clear is the enforcement powers. So there is a discussion about OIC being more enhanced in their in enforcement, and that was really great to see that they're thinking about it. But how how is that going to actually look like? So if all of these protections are in place, which is great, what is it actually going to look like uh, when it's being enforced? How is it going to be tested and assessed? So for different areas, such as the banking sector or in other sectors where you've got a way um, to test and assess and pause uh, when you see uh, an emerging harm take place. You, you see it in product safety. There's a way to actually uh, bring in interim bans when you see a product that's new to the market is potential to cause harm or, it, or has caused harm. It can, there can be a ban put in place um, and then you can evaluate, a regulator can evaluate it and it goes from there to then bring in a permanent ban uh, by the minister. The other side of it is there are product intervention powers that currently exist in the finance sector where a regulator like ASIC can investigate and put, a, even though at the moment it's a temporary ban, but a ban on particular or restrictions on particular practices. So that's something we aren't quite seeing at the moment from what I've seen so far. Um, what, would we, what we'd really like to see is the regulator be uh, the, the privacy regulator be as strong as our other regulators, like the competition consumer regulator and our, um, as, like, like ASIC. So uh, it really needs to be at par with the performance and needs to be able to have the support to be able to do that. They are definitely under-resourced um, There and the way to support, there needs to be one, give them the powers to give them the resources to be able to do what they need to do to help keep Australians safe. So, I mean, diving into some of the detail that is there, and it is a 320-page document, there's an awful lot there. Uh, one of the things I noticed was the proposal to give Australians the right to opt out of targeted marketing. Um, typically speaking, at least to my understanding of the way a lot of these schemes typically work, um, there's a bigger consumer benefit to making those things inherently opt in or is it just the case that we've already opted in because we use a Google or a Facebook or whatever? Wouldn't wouldn't opt in be a better phrasing for that or a better approach? So I do, and they have talked about um, privacy by default framework, mm. but they've only mentioned it. It's unclear what that would actually look like. Um, it's definitely the opt out is a step forward if it's clear and user friendly, really easy to access without question. Um, however, we've we've always um, we, I mean, we've always championed pro privacy defaults to be able to opt into things to see things to be have those things come through instead of opt out. Uh, so that is something we will be looking into in more detail over the next few weeks. Uh, but certainly, if there is some things that are just not allowed, and they one thing that I really noticed was that notice and consent, so making sure that there are just some things that would be restricted, and therefore notice and consent would only be used in the absolute um, absolute necessary places. That can help to some extent, uh, but ideally, pro, uh, ideally, you would want to be having these conversations where you are opting in instead of instead of having to go down every single platform and opt out. Because let's face it, we're not just on one or two platforms. We are we are everywhere, and we are consuming information online from everywhere. There's been talk for a while about the idea of the right to be forgotten. Uh, I know they've talked about it a bit in the EU. Is that something we have here now or is that something that's proposed under this? So it's uh, yes and no. So they have touched on the idea of uh, the right to be forgotten. But what's what they've uh, proposed is de-indexing. So it's uh, right to be forgotten would be completely forget me from all sorts of parts of the internet. Now, no, noting that not everything is on, um, not every website you visit, not every platform you visit is is um, Australian, it could be somewhere else, um, makes the whole right to be forgotten 
it's it would be more complex ideally ideal mm. to be able to do that but potentially inherently complex de-indexing it is a step forward in a way that what it's doing is it's allowing um you as a as an individual to have the likes of search engines um not not show results um off you of the things that you do not want them to see we you want others to see sorry i should say and so that is the uh, that is just that one step forward and that will be harder to find things so you not not that you would be forgotten but it would be harder to find you one of the reasons that the the EU, I think it's the GDPR, if I remember the terminology correctly, uh, one of the things that the EU's uh, model for that, I think, had as, has as a strength is the size of their market. They, they could kind of say, look, we're, we're a decent chunk of the internet, not all of it, of course. We're a decent chunk of the internet, so what we say goes. How difficult are some of these proposals, including de-indexing, going to be to enforce given Australia, you know, we're, what, 25 million people and change or something like that? Uh, we're a small market. Are, are these are these laws simply going to affect an Australian, you know, publisher or online site, but nothing else? Well, we're small, but we're mighty. Um, so we'll remember that way. But one of the things is that the way the the way the reforms are being proposed, they're being proposed in a way where it it is harmonising a lot with the other international standards. So it should be able to capture i mean yes it's ambitious but i'm so glad that it is ambitious what they're what they're hoping to achieve uh, but what that will allow you allow um uh, companies to do is to be able to streamline their approach so if, if it is harmonized and really aligns with a lot of the international protections which are uh, well ahead from where we are at the moment um, we will be in a much better we're likely to be in much better position um, in terms of the protections we have so but again it all depends on though how it's enforced and I think uh, um, and how businesses will be held accountable uh, on that, so that that is going to be where where the test will come through. Um, I find it interesting some of the things that, in theory, if all of this goes through, and again, this is I think under consultation until the end of March, I think yes, it is, and then that's right. Th then they propose moving forward with whatever data they've gathered. Then uh, are the exemptions because, for example, under the current very ancient. Privacy Act, small businesses are exempt, but my understanding is they probably wouldn't be or they're suggesting they might not be. But political parties will broadly still be exempt, although they have to have um, published privacy policies and uh, uh, there's there's odd political statements. I think it's that they can't directly target voters outside of political affiliations. I'm, I'm not even sure if that's a sentence that they makes sense. They sound like sense. weasel words. They sound <laughs> they very do. much like weasel words to me. Um is it a, I guess the broader question here is, is it a good sign when we're talking about, well, let's have a new revised wonderful Privacy Act, but let's put all these loopholes in here straight from the get-go? So the small business, uh, what they're suggesting at the moment is that it would apply to all, all businesses. <laughs> and um, in in one way, when you look at it, it's it's really positive because it there we know of small businesses like take your real estate agency um they collect a lot of sensitive data about you mm. it is a small business they should be able to have a way um, and should be held accountable for keeping that information safe um, from being uh, the way it's collected to the way it's um whether it's shared outside and how it's used, they should have those obligations in place. I don't think anyone will disagree with that. It's, so the sensitivity of the information could also play a role in this. I think it will be a really interesting discussion where we end up, um, because I think it's a discussion that small businesses need to be part of as well. We'll need to be un, uh, we'll need to understand uh, what the impost might be on them, but also what are the obligations that would just mean that it's a fair outcome for for Australians so it it'll be it'll be interesting where it goes but I, it's really positive at the moment that they are willing to open um, to at least have that considered because there it there is definitely a recognition that the way data is used and the way it's um, 
collected and shared. It's not just about the big tech companies. Yes, that is definitely up there, but it is, it's the sensitivity of it. And uh, everyone, uh, everyone in that data space has a role to play to keep consumers safe. We now pause Vertical Hold to remind you to subscribe to Vertical Hold so that you can get every episode as soon as it hits every Friday delivered fresh through whichever podcast app you choose to use. So keeping with a privacy theme, when we say privacy and Google in the same sentence, it doesn't usually end well. (laughs) It's not usually a very positive kind of thing. And Google this week has announced a new Privacy sandbox for Android users. Um, Adam, a sandbox is the kind of thing I used to play with as a kid, or in some cases, the kind of thing that my cat might use for things that we won't talk about right now. Uh, What's Google actually doing with its privacy sandbox? What is it? Well, a sandbox more generally is what the, when they're talking about an application that it runs basically in its own little area where it's not connected to everywhere else. So it can do its thing but it can't necessarily see everything else on your phone. So that's the general concept of a sandbox. So they're applying that to privacy. So saying this app can, these apps can do what they need to do, but that doesn't mean they've got free reign to collect data from other apps to tell everybody all about you. We're sort of limiting the scope of what they can do. Now, some of that's already in place, but the main things going through what's go- what Google has said, and I'll, I'll just read from their notes here because it's as usual, it's 90% fluff and 10% actual detail. So the bit that looks like actual detail says that this proposes to sh- limit the sharing of user data with third parties and operate without cross-app identifiers, including advertising IDs. And the other half of it is exploring technologies to reduce the potential for COVID data collection including safer ways for apps to integrate with advertising tools. Sounds good in um, practice. Sorry, it sounds good in theory. What will it look like in practice? So it's really interesting. A lot of the focus often is on who is collecting my data and how and who are they sharing it with. They're the two spaces. But the one where there is the highest risk of harm is how is that data being used? And what from what I've seen so far, what it seems like it's it's focusing on the use side of things. So we're still going to be able to target um, particular marketing practices and, and it's still going to be able to zone in on what you need. It just means that data is sitting somewhere else. So it's not actually ha- being completely handed over. It sounds like decisions will still be made based on your data because of the way um, either how information is profiled through um, those categories or however that might end up looking like beyond the sandbox. So it is it is really interesting because I think one of the things we really need to be careful of, and this is why it's so important to get the foundations right in a Privacy Act and being able to really restrict and ban certain practices that are just not okay, because this is where you'll then be able to limit the harm. Um, because yes, it is really great to say, yeah, we're not gonna be uh, sharing the data. We'll only be keeping it here. We're keeping it really safe. But then you are. it looks like there are other means are being um, created to be able for, for targeting to still happen. Um, and so we just need to have it in a way that it's not causing harm. Um, there was a recent report by the Foundation of um, alcohol and research education, and specifically people, 90% of people who they had surveyed were concerned about seeing um, advertising of products that they were trying to give up. Mm. And if the categorizing is not done correctly, or if there are, or just the way the algorithm works, you just do not know what uh, a consumer might be exposed to. So it'll be an interesting space of where it goes through. It's great. <laughs> I'll, give, I'll, I'll give a little shout out to Google. It's great that they're thinking about it, about where to go in terms of collection sharing, but um, we really need to be careful on how data is being used and how it could, it could be potentially harming consumers down the, down the long-term end. Is this Google just trying to do no evil for a change or is that they replying, they responding to changing regulations around the world? Like are they trying to get in front of the law? 
Well, certainly with the change um, internationally of for third party cookies uh, not being able to be used, there they will have to. They will. I mean, these are our businesses, not just Google, but other businesses that have that have profited a lot from from collecting, understanding, and using people's data in potentially interests in the interests that are not very much to the consumer, but to um, to them. So yes, they're, they're potentially looking at how things, they might be looking at how things are going forward in terms of each of the jurisdictions having a really clear look on, on privacy and how it's actually um, going to protect its consumers or its people within its countries but at the same time yeah of course they're going to be creative they it's it's no surprise that they're going to be creative to see um, where they can um, still still profit from from those data data enabled practices that they have um, as, but how that's done uh, will really come down to what the foundation laws are if the the safeguards are in place you've got guardrails in place very specifically on what can and can't be done you've got if you've got an enforcement a regulator who can actively enforce and mitigate harm before it before it causes widespread harm that they're the things that are going to help shift some of that behavior i wonder if their model here isn't really designed to, to... I'm not going to say sidestep because that does sound like they're being legally dodgy, but sidestep <laughs> in a way, uh, sidestep some of that regulation because the model they're talking about, which we kind of haven't delved into that much, uh, is basically this idea of you'll do a bunch of activity on your phone, you'll do a bunch of Google searches or whatever that will indicate that you're interested in knitting, alcohol, and car racing to, to pick three. Wow, that's kind of quite things. a combination. That's yeah. a good it's, Friday it's a, night. That is yeah, a yeah, good that's a Friday, very good Friday night. night. That's a great Friday night. But um, that you're interested in those things. And classically right at the moment, Google would be able to say, right, well, you visited this knitting forum, you bought these bottles of booze, and you watched this car race on YouTube or whatever. What they're now saying is on device, they will just grind all that up and go, right, you're interested in knitting booze and car racing. And that's the stuff that they'll then be able to supply to advertisers of wool, booze, and tyres, I guess. Um, so in a way, they, I guess they could argue, well, look, we're not, we are somewhat de-identifying this stuff. We're not saying you're interested in this brand of beer or this type of tyre or this colour of wool. We're just saying these, these broader things. Uh, is that an approach, though, that, that we can regulate around? Is this a, is this a clever ploy? Yeah, well, you, you've picked up on a really interesting thing about de-identification, uh, de and it has been touched in the privacy law, uh, in the, mm. sorry, in the privacy review report at the moment, uh, where they have looked at things being de-identified and not being re-identified, uh, de-identified in a way that it can't be re-identified and then therefore used for targeting. Um, so, and you've, we've seen there's measures for um, not using data, de-identified data that can be re-identified. Like it's an offence in in Singapore, in uh, Canada's are already thinking about it in the UK as well. So um, there's already things in place to um, circumvent some of that de-identification being re-identified and then going back for back in to target or profile specific people but this is where it, it will be really interesting how um, how businesses navigate the, the the field at the moment in in terms of privacy and the, you will start to see really creative ways uh, because it's been a long time since businesses have been able to profit from the way they use data and the way um, and the way they can target very very uh, in a very finite way um, and so I think the sandbox is probably just one of the many, many new inventions we're going to see where they will test the laws of, of different jurisdictions. So is this likely to have a big impact on the bottom line of some businesses or some advertisers? We saw what happened to Facebook when Apple introduced some um, tighter restrictions around this. 
Well, for some businesses who have very much have relied on a bundled consent approach and then things have just gone from there and for them, they've profited from data, uh, database practices for them. Yeah, it's, it's definitely going, they'll, they'll have to think of a shift um, on how they, they do things. That doesn't mean it's going to completely, it shouldn't, it shouldn't have to be profiting from, from uh, the causing harm to someone else. So I think if we start looking at what is fair, what is, uh, are we doing things that are in the interest of the consumers and community, uh, then the, the shift changes and potentially your um, businesses and the way they um, monetize their different activities changes as well. It's one thing actually in the Privacy Act at the moment, they have actually talked about um, a best interest uh, for data collection, use and sharing to be in the best interest of for, for children. So if it takes place, it has to be in the interest of the child um, and, and none otherwise. Something like that, a, a, a duty of care or a best interest that could be applied more widely. I mean, this is where you'd start really seeing a shift in how businesses will, uh, how businesses would operate. And it would be a shift that you, you'd see innovation in a way that would be actually good for consumers as opposed to, um, creating new um, new and different harms for them. Well, I mean, speaking on the Facebook thing, their drop was primarily because Apple blocked cross-app identifiers completely. They basically just said, you can't share data between apps without clear consent. And, of course, as soon as people said, oh, do you really want to share your camera data with Facebook? A lot of people went, uh, no, I don't think I do. And they had to keep on operating within that. That saw Facebook's revenue tumble. Um Apple, uh, sorry, not Apple, Google is is talking about cross-app app identifiers, but in a much softer way. And in fact, their language around this is really, if you can read between the lines, it's really very specifically anti-Apple. They've said, you know, other platforms have taken a, a different approach to ads privacy, bluntly restricting existing technologies used by developers and advertisers. We believe that, and this is Google's words, not mine, without first providing a privacy-preserving alternative path, such approaches can be ineffective and lead to worse outcomes for user privacy and developer businesses. There's a lot of business in that and not a lot of user. Is Google just protecting its bottom line here? Does it actually care about its, about the users who are the product, as we've said so many times on the show? Well, if businesses uh, naturally, traditionally in our economies, are there to protect their bottom line. And this is why it's so important to get regulations right um, and the laws right to ensure that consumers, uh, that the other end of it, the people, the individuals are protected in a way um, so that consumer businesses can have their bottom line, but not at the expense of all of us. Well, that just about wraps up this week's episode of Vertical Hold. Thanks to Chandni for joining us. Thank you for having me. So great to chat with you both. It has been great. And look, now it is time for me to ask for you to opt in to something you didn't entirely see coming, the Vertical Hold Three Questions of Doom. So please click here if you agree. <laughs> oh, well, you've not been completely transparent about what those three questions are, so I don't think I can fully opt in. <laughs> Fair but, enough. Yeah, I'll opt in. I trust you. Go ahead. <laughs> I, 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 will, I will, in fact... Uh, in, in accordance with with reasonable privacy principles, I will read out all three questions before you have to answer any of them, <laughs> and then you can answer them in the order in which you choose. Oh, sounds Can't good. Can't be more transparent than that. <laughs> They're all fairly simple anyway, as the long-term listeners will know. Where can people find you online if they want to do so? Where can they find you on social media if you are on social media? And a one-time privacy-centric sort of contentious question. We've talked a lot about regulations. We've talked a lot about what the rules should be. Let's say that we make you Prime Minister with an overarching majority in every field of government for a day. What consumer law change are you going to make? Oh, oh that's a nice one. <laughs> okay, so you can find my work on cprc.org.au. Uh, I'm on Twitter at at underscore Chandani Gupta, or you can find me on LinkedIn. You just need to search Chandani Gupta. Um, the one law, well, there is one law. It's really close to my heart, and it's a prohibition on unfair trading, 
we have we are one of the few jurisdictions that don't have an unfair trading prohibition, which means unfair business practices are legal. Um, US has had a prohibition like this since 1930s. Um, the EU has had an unfair commercial practices directive since 2005. It's time Australia made it illegal to have unfair practices here in Australia. Uh, here. Um, and I'd love to see that. So that was one of the first things I would bring into force. <laughs> Viva el Presidente. <laughs> yeah, look, honestly, I'd vote I'd vote for that. And it's a good job you're becoming the Prime Minister and not me because my, my proposals would be considerably more out there. But I will leave those for another day. And as always, if you want to catch us online, you can do so at Vertical Hold AU on Twitter, via the Vertical Hold Facebook page, or on the web at verticalhold.com.au. Thanks, everyone, for opting in once again. Don't forget to drop us a line. Tell us what you love about the show. Tell us what we can do better in 2023.